we're now officially in double digits of Lunch Academy, Launch Academy's Offside Banter to our everyday lives here. Um, as always, my name is Sam and I'm your co-host and I have with me always as star of the show, Miss Sade Souk. She always does the gang sign. <laughs> like, no, I don't which, know which, any gang Which sign. gang this is, like, like it's gang like a Sesame Street gang or something. Um, um yeah. Excited. How are you doing? 10th episode. We said we were going to do something big for our 10th episode. We, we have a very big hey, episode. I'm pretty yeah. big for our 10th episode. Yeah, yeah. it's like this is a really, we got an important guest. We got, you yeah, we have, we, well, we have, we have a very important guest. We got a lot to talk about. And we're not going to do um, what the four today because we got so much to talk about. We just, all four are just going to be in here. <laughs> um, so we're going to focus on that. So I want to introduce uh, Krump Rani. Um, co-founder, head of education at Lighthouse Lab. So welcome to our show. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here. It's awesome. So, so you've seen us like monkeying around doing doing these shows and you're like, hey, I want to get in on that. Um, so we're really lucky to have have you here. And, and frankly, like you you've been around Launch Academy as long as you've been around the Lighthouse Labs too. So there's, I mean, there's a ton of stories that that we can go into. But um, lots of history. Yeah, but before we before we do that, as always on this show. We talk about everything Vancouver is talking about, so we we tricked you into coming to the show because of food. Um, so that's so, fair. That's, that's um, the perfect kind of show. The other thing we talk about is Vancouver rights is how is the weather? You're gonna have to predict. So, the so weather? go for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm the official weather. Weather. Oh, okay. Weather forecast. Weather how's our weekend here? looking like? Epic. It's gonna be super sunny, super hot, and we've got like a good eight days in a row of that. So today is the last day of like. Meh, so so today is we and, the, and how this episode is special is we're actually re-recording um, on a on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. Oh yeah. Okay, so we do have to clarify that. Yes. We are gonna release this on Friday. So but right you, now it's Tuesday. So, so listeners, it is Friday for you, but we're we're going back sunny. in time. It's gonna and be it's gorgeous, and I'm sweating right now. So that's <laughs> that's what's happening. <laughs> I'm glad to hear the weather's gonna be good on the weekend. I'm gonna be yeah. Gibson's. Hopefully Gibson's is gonna be. Oh, it's gonna be beautiful. Good. I'm gonna awesome. be in um, Squamish. Hiking up this crazy river where you go and there's like waterfalls and then there's a lake. It's called Echo Lake. If anybody ever wants to do that hike, it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna be at home watching Netflix. No. With two fans. What about Not Kopi? Fans. Kopi's gotta go enjoy the sun. Kopi will also be Kopi's Kopi my is dog. Sam's dog. <laughs> Kopi will also be watching Netflix. I feel like there should be an episode focusing on Sade and her crazy nature adventure. <laughs> yes. I feel like she has a lot to talk about there as well. <laughs> For sure. I will report about that adventure on the next. Her adventures are not as exciting as mine though, but mine are exciting in a very stupid way. Mm -hmm. So that 10K that we've been talking about in a couple of episodes, yeah. so it turns out I got a stress fracture during the 10K. <laughs> oh no. It's not something I'm proud to talk about, so let's just move on. Just more dramatic adventures. Yes, just more dramatic <laughs> embarrassing adventures. <laughs> but let, let's get back to you, Krum. So, so I mean, like, when, when did Life Last Lab start now? Like, it feels like forever, right? <laughs> yeah, it does. It's, it's definitely been a lot of long days, weeks, and years. Um, uh, we're, about, we're approaching five years. Five. So it was, uh, it was... You're like a grandpa in startup age, right? Like that, <laughs> yeah. That's what it's like. It's yeah. like almost in line with Launch Academy. Uh, yeah, actually, I think Logic had been been around for about a year or change. Yeah, so we're so we around safe, five, so, yeah. so it's like this good math. Yeah. Um. So yeah, let's, like you guys had four co-founders. What what was the beginning like, and, and how did all this come about? Like, what I guess more more about like tell the audience what your background is first of all, and then how kind of this this animal shaped itself. Yeah. So I guess I'll do a little bit of a quick intro. Yeah. So my name is Karan Varani. Uh, I'm presently uh, co-founder and head of education at Lattice Labs, which is the company we were just talking about. And Lattice Labs, uh, we'll get into it, but started out of Launch Academy, in Launch Academy, um, you know, with uh, the co-founders that you mentioned, moving from, mostly actually moving all from Toronto to Vancouver, finding a space or looking for a space, thankfully finding Launch Academy as the space to spawn in. Uh, and then it was, you know, that's when Did you guys all come, come here just for, for Lighthouse, or was it like you were going to move here anyway? And then a, bit of, a bit of A and a bit of B. Yeah. Uh, I knew that I was kind of looking for a change from yeah. Toronto and wanted to move to Vancouver. My wife, thankfully, was very supportive in that decision. <laughs> I strong arm slash convinced my existing co-founders in other companies yeah. that this was a good idea. Um, so and, why and that's Vancouver? Why, why the big push towards coming here to set it up? Why not set so it up many, in Toronto? Not like, we're biased, so, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm so glad that was the decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I love Toronto for very different reasons than I love Vancouver, and that's a, a pretty deep topic. Uh, and there isn't really one reason why it was Vancouver. It was a combination of personal reasons that I 
definitely saw myself drawn to a city that I never visited, by the way. <laughs> so you just moved without people visit. made fun of me for like just basically deciding to move to Vancouver, including my partners were like, wait, why aren't we doing more competitive analysis in other cities like Montreal and Toronto instead of just saying Vancouver, that's it, let's do it. Uh, so there was definitely emotion and not just rationality in that decision, like many startups, right? Yeah. It's not just about being making a rational choice, and we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. At least that's my opinion. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, sort of, we did do a little bit of market analysis and realized that the opportunities in Vancouver were really good at the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was definitely, and still is, quite small compared to the other yeah. uh, larger cities yeah. in, in Canada and North America. So and you were looking for a growing. I was looking for, yeah, I think, you know, you want to be riding the wave and, mm -hmm. or, and obviously have influence in the wave as opposed to, uh, oh, this is already a hot scene, let me go in there. At least that's my, was yeah. my approach and my mindset with this. Yeah, you want, you want to be not so, so early that you're irrelevant, but mm -hmm. not so late that you're just kind of, yeah. you know, just picking up crumbs, right? So, Timing is a really, really big, yeah. obviously a very important part of, of yeah. startups, right? So, so kind, of, kind of just to paint more of this picture of the beginning. So you guys came here, you moved here, found launch coming, like what, why did you guys come here? Like, like, did you begin with just a website? Was it like web courses? Like when did it become in-person courses? And, and why launch I think it's, it's, it's kind of like a, at least, at least on paper, it wasn't, it probably isn't the exact fit. I don't see too many you know, labs or, or coding camps that start out of like an incubator specifically, especially with expansion of space and all this stuff. So it's like, how did you guys come to, to here? And I guess you met Ray and Alex and then all those other guys. And, and what did that, what did that, how, how did it come out of that? Yeah, I think, you know, at the time and even today, um, I think it, the Launch Academy was the perfect fit. Uh, and it was, I think, for mutually yeah. beneficial, perfect fit for Launch Academy. Uh, the story, in terms of like when it started in 2013 of yeah. October, when I when we started our first cohort, yeah. so I guess a month before that, when yeah. I moved to Vancouver, yeah. um, is that we were looking for spaces, yeah. and we weren't necessarily saying that we want a community space that already exists that we're going to tap into and jump into, but rather we just needed a space that was, that had the right startup energy and tech energy. Yeah. And we looked at a bunch of different office spaces, most of which, except for Launch Academy, were like our own, you know, we'd have to create the, the culture and the environment from scratch. Yeah. And that's fine, that was something that we did in Toronto, we can yeah. talk about that in the future. Um, but we, when I, when I walked into Launch Academy actually, which had already been toured by the other founders who had arrived to Vancouver yeah. first, uh, they had talked with Ray, Ray had actually said, sorry, I, I don't think I have space for you guys. Yeah. And when I came back with them to see Launch Academy, uh, I was like, as soon as I walked into Launch Academy, I was like, this is the space for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just the energy in the space, the people, the startup kind of hustle that was mm -hmm. happening every day, seeing people in late hours, seeing people in on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, honestly, things like the lighting, things like the brick and <laughs> beam, things yeah. like just uh, uh, a diversity of people mm -hmm. was huge for me. Uh, it made me very nervous to not only move to a new city, start a new startup, but then also yeah. have to do the culture and, and yeah. space settings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not to mention that you're, you know, none of us were tapped into the Vancouver community. Yeah. So a big undertaking for us, and many startups are in that situation, right? Startups coming through, let's say, startup visa program, or even yeah. they're non-technical people, and this is, uh, maybe they weren't tapped into the tech community, mm -hmm. and they're now trying to do that as part of their tech startup. Yeah. I personally feel that, and I say this to everybody that I tour at Launch Academy, or that I just talk about a lot about Launch Academy, that it is one of my favorite tech hubs in North America. And it continues to be. It was five years ago and it continues to be now. So uh, I think awesome. the energy here is phenomenal and it's something that's benefited Lighthouse mm -hmm. beyond words. And I think this, you know, I, and I hope the same is true for Launch Academy in terms yeah. of the benefits that Lighthouse brought to you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and I guess now is where I clarify that we are not paying Chrome to say this. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the kind words. Hey, you know, you know, we have demo days every every month. Yeah. Our students graduate. Yeah. In our program. We'll talk more about that as well, hopefully. But yeah. Every time we start demo day in Vancouver, yeah. we give a big big round of applause and thanks to Launch Academy. That's before awesome. Before we start, yeah, the day. That's definitely awesome. really appreciate that. And then having you guys in the space, I mean, I can see the value that it's brought. At least for me, just being here for I've been here for a year, and this is just what I've seen so far, and it's already pretty incredible that a lot of our startups have hired from Lighthouse Labs and that's so cool to see that we'd be able to just like have that like demand and supply in the same place helping yeah. each other out. Yeah. And let me let me take a step back there. Like like I think it's easy to, you know, 
people listening, they're going to be Googling Lighthouse Labs, seeing like what, what you guys do, and it's easy to just say, oh, you're a coding boot camp, or, or if I'm using a more old school word, you're, you're a coding school, right? you're a school, and you teach coding. Um, but, you know, from my interaction, you know, we, we do this day in, day out, and we work very closely with each other, like, we know there's a lot more that goes on to that. So what, what you know, from, from the founders, I think, what's your mentality, and like, what are you trying to build here? That's a really, really good question, yeah. So. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the way Lighthouse Labs started was just like any startup where you are not necessarily thinking necessarily the biggest possible picture. Mm -hmm. And as the startup progresses, and as opportunities come to you, and as you start seeing the solutions manifest in this, and as your culture and staff grow, you start to define the bigger vision and the bigger mission. Right? We're five years in, so yes, we're a startup, but we're also a company that's matured quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. and has more you know, defined processes and things of that nature. Um, our vision has, you know, been better defined more recently. Yeah. Um, so yes, you're right. Uh, we're uh, a big part of our programming. A big part of what we do uh, is part of our education. Yeah. Is the the coding bootcamp, which yeah. is a very immersive, intense ten week program. Uh, two programs actually. Yeah. One is web and one is iOS. Yeah. Our biggest being our web program. Yeah. Uh, where students who are essentially novice, very early developers may not even touch code or curious yeah. about this stuff, uh, and have found an interest. Yeah. can actually enter into the career of being a software developer, yeah. whether it be web or iOS, mm -hmm. yeah. instead of going through a two, three, four, five year long yeah. uh, undergraduate program or something of yeah. that nature. So it's very much an accelerated uh, process, where, but they have to give up a lot of other things in their life mm -hmm. in order to, to take on this challenge because it's yeah. not, A, it's not for necessarily everyone, yeah. and B, it definitely takes a certain commitment um, yeah. in terms of the focus, right? We're talking about a boot camp here, and what that word entails is essentially like 60 hour yeah. weeks for 10 weeks straight. Yeah, I think boot camp has been like mismarketed since we threw it on computers. Cause yeah. Like, like you yeah. think, and, and now it's like Zumba boot camp or, or you know what I mean? But yeah, like yeah. boot camp back in the day, we're talking military, like yeah. that was some serious stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, not we, we try, we try, we try, we try of course to have the ethos of the boot camp. Yeah. But you, no extreme is good. Yeah. Is my personal philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, too relaxed of an education model is not yeah. good, and too intense of an education yeah. model can have its pitfalls. Yeah. Um, we can get into that. Yeah. Coming back to our mission, though, yeah. uh, our larger vision and our larger mission that we're executing yeah. on, um, and have been executing on for a while, is to help uh, people enter and continue developing as software developers yeah. in, in their communities. So while we started off with just the entering part, yeah. hey. You know, this is the this is the vehicle to become a software developer. We're now also focusing on not just that, but also continuing education, which I think is the one of the biggest gaps uh, in not only technology but generally our society yeah. uh, when it comes to lifelong learning and continuing education. Yeah. That's where our, our society hasn't really defined proper education and proper yeah. It's uh, like courses. You got the degree, here you go. That's yeah, it's very much like front loaded. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of front investment, and then good luck. <laughs> um, and you know, and you could argue the same thing for boot camps, right? Yeah. Like when we started, it was you know that eight-week program at the time, and yeah. uh, we obviously have a lot of things on the career services side yeah. to help kind of uh, people uh, into their uh, into their first jobs as a software developer. Yeah. But um, and we provide a lot of support for alumni. But I think there's a lot more we could be doing, and we are starting yeah. to do. Uh, I think what you guys are doing already is pretty amazing, like harnessing your years of experience in the industry. So obviously you've probably built a circle of connections and of networks that know the kind of quality students that you have, the graduates that you have, and therefore you're just allowed, you're able to help students find jobs and then also help the market find quality graduates. So it's really cool how you guys took both sides and, and were able to support both. And now we've got five years of that built up and there's like, that's, you can't what's, even What's the developer count? Just well, uh, in terms yeah. of our graduates, yeah. yeah, so I think we've run, and of course the number keeps changing, yeah. uh, but we've run approximately 75 bootcamp cohorts. Yeah. We have part-time courses that are not yeah. coming in. Yeah. And you guys have um, a ridiculously high percentage of hires? Yeah, we're at uh, approximately 96% oh, of success coming out of I think the world should know that. 97, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of you know success as uh, getting a you know, technical position, a developer yeah. position after are you, graduating. Are you guys hands-on with every student, or is that something that you provide if it's kind of requested from a student? Like no, it's, it's a huge part of our education. So, taking a step back once again, yeah. we don't believe that bootcamp is a 10-week or 12-week or, you know, a short journey of that nature to yeah. becoming a junior 
developer. Yeah. One of our core principles that we talk about a lot is that bootcamp is actually a six to 12 months journey to becoming a junior developer. So our graduates, yes, they are junior developers, but they are junior developers in training. Let's be honest, they're taking a 10 week program and yeah. they have not coded at all before. Yeah. Uh, so we're very much not a like magic bullet. Uh, <laughs> and we don't, we're very careful in our admissions process to yeah. not let people in who think that that is the case. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a, at least a year, yeah, there's at least a six to 12 month journey before you can comfortably call yourself a junior developer. So the bootcamp, the part that you pay us for as a student is the structured part, the part that we've kind of curated in terms of a classroom environment, yeah. trying to make it as real world as possible. Mm -hmm. And then there's the career services part and the employment, your job, yeah. where you, know, you continue to learn on the job, mm -hmm. first with an internship usually, that's a paid full-time internship, but with the hope, with the hope and, and, and expectation yeah. that you're learning quite a bit for those three to four yeah. months that you've after you graduate, yeah. followed with a more of the full-time salary that you'd expect yeah. in the market. So there's a little bit of a transition, and actually we were the ones that, dare I say, and I haven't fact-checked this, but pioneered the idea of no, no, after you graduate, don't request a just a junior level salary. Go through an intermediate process of an apprenticeship, essentially, where you're actually taking on less salary. So that your expectation with the employer that you are ex expecting more mentorship yeah. in a way possible. Yeah. That's not always possible with every yeah. strategy you join, yeah. uh, and we have workarounds for that. But yeah. uh, mm -hmm. again, it's a six to twelve month journey uh, for bootcamp, whether it's our iOS yeah. bootcamp or, or our uh, web bootcamp. Yeah, and I, and I think you know, from from my standpoint, just looking you know from the launch point, you said one one big success factor. I think I think we can go into numbers all day long, but to me, one of the indicators of success was your own staff started taking the program. Yeah, it's happened quite a bit. And, 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 and you know, your, your programs keep stealing your staff, <laughs> which is an interesting problem, but it's also proving that, that your product works, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like, it's not just life changing for people you're you know, marketing to, selling to. It's people who actually believe in this so much that they're going to quit working with you so they can learn how to code, which is, this is a very interesting problem. Um, Wait, but, did that happen before? Oh, multiple times. That's uh, hilarious. We, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a double-edged sword where, we, <laughs> but you know, we do believe in our staff that yeah. they are, they're, you know, this is a, it's all about learning, right? It's all about stepping stones. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously when it comes to, okay, we understand that after a year yeah, or two years with us, yeah. you're looking at potentially how am I growing within the company or, or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course, being exposed to the success of our students here in the program, our, we've had community managers, and actually now our education manager just recently announced to the students that uh, she'll be, you know, leaving us. Yeah. And what's what, the whole room went wild, and she was like, "Yeah, I'm taking you can." Uh, <laughs> and they were super, they were making fun of her, yeah. but also like super supportive at the same time yeah, because so cool. she's actually the perfect personality for yeah. her as well. And so it's happened. I think about, I think about four or five times already. Wow. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's a key thing about, about startups too. I think that is under under talked about, especially when you know you're first starting out. And for in your case, you had four guys, so that was already quite a bit in terms of the founding team. Um, but smaller startups, they're very careful and intricate with their first hires. And and those people, dare I say it, they'll usually wear multiple hats. They're they're not just like I'm a pure salesman or I'm a pure coder. And that's it. I don't care about the product or, or whatever. Um, but the, the, the underlying issue with that is, is as you know, that company grows and, and that person finds success, there's a definite, I don't know the numbers either, there's a higher percentage of those people getting that itch and going, I'm gonna go do my own thing, you know, that too. And, and that's actually very healthy for, for starts in my opinion, because that's, that's just the normal progression. You want, you want to hire hustlers, you want to hire go-getters, eventually they're gonna wake up one day and be like, it's cool that I, I hustled for you, but mm -hmm. now it's my turn. Right, and that I've seen that happen time and time again, and and, and and frankly, those people that have you know work as you know your first employee or whatever, and they go and start their own thing, their success track record is they're just much more reasonable and realistic with their expectations. They know it's a grind. They've seen the work. They've done the work, yeah. um, and they decided to do it anyway. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so like that, I think having that mentality for for your staff is is really good actually, yeah. because it's not it, it's very realistic. Like like I yeah. I look at Ray's founding team. Like Alex is now doing his own thing, right? Like yeah. all, all the other guys. I can I can keep going down the list. You're saying does his own thing. Um, I feel like the launch academy too. It's a very high risk environment for your employees. I believe because we surround ourselves with really cool startups all the time. And I could I mean I've only been around for we're approachable. <laughs> but it's like how you know, like how working for Ray, 
can imagine the stress of like building a team and knowing that they're going to be exposed to like all these other startups that are probably going to try to push them. And yeah. it's like that's building a culture that he's done pretty well at maintaining Based on trust. our team Based and on building. Trust. Based on trust, yeah. that, you know, trust, not just that, not trust, I don't mean trust that you won't leave us. Yeah. That's the yeah. wrong type of trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's the trust that we will discuss yeah. and, and we'll, mm -hmm. from day one, uh, beyond and not just yeah. until you stop working officially for yeah. the company yeah. is there there's a personal trust between mm -hmm. our staff and our founding team and yeah. our leadership team mm -hmm. it's about it's about like growth and, mm -hmm. and just honesty yeah. our, our staff actually like I, th I, I imagine it's more than the standard which is that our staff gives give us generally when they decide that they're going to go on to something else uh, they give us generally around 12 to 6, six to 12 months notice wow. Um, wow. so we already knew the, the transitions that we just kind of outlined, we already knew 60 12 months in advance. That, that they happened. were like so, sort yeah. of almost yeah. starting, yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm thinking yeah. about using, looking yeah. at bootcamp. It's not something they tell us a month in advance. It's yeah. like 60 to 12 months yeah. in advance. Let's talk a little bit about your culture. Because I mean, I see it from an outsider. So I'm, if, for I all mean, of you guys who don't know, I have my desk is like facing the White House lab staff area. <laughs> so I see the constant dynamic. You have to, you have to put up with our loudness and our, uh, our <laughs> there chaos. There is laughter. <laughs> There is banjo playing, ukulele, cakes every day. Um, no, cakes desks, every day is us. They eat all types of food. Desks get covered. Vicky, Vicky is always bringing all these crazy cakes, and then there's desks covered in foil paper. <laughs> yeah. Pranks being pulled, birthdays being celebrated. How have you done so far replicating that amazing culture? While still getting it? work done. Let's be real. <laughs> yeah. It, so how do you? Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your culture and then and tell us about that transition of like establishing that in Toronto. Yeah, um, it's definitely been, listen, this is not something I've done 10 times before. Um, so when it, <laughs> comes to, when it comes to successful startups, you know, I can count mine in one hand and that's a pretty small number. Um, so I'm not trying to be an authority here in any yes. way, it's just my opinions. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Sam said something uh, that really resonates with me, which is that the staff are, are you know, what you alluded to is that the staff are a big key to culture. Right? It's all about hiring the right staff, especially at the beginning when stakes are high and the risk is high. But then also to continue that trend forward. Um, so I think given, given that our business is very much a people-oriented business, our education is all in person. Mm -hmm. We don't offer online courses. Mm -hmm. right? We don't intend to. Our goal is very much to marry the curriculum with the in-person experience. Cool. So hiring the right staff that motivate each other but also are where students want to be was well, something we identified right at the beginning is that something is something we have to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so we took our recruitment process seriously. You know, our, Remy, our GM, whose table was uh, covered in aluminum foil, and when he got back after a week in, with leadership offsite meetings, uh, <laughs> he went through seven or eight different interviews uh, with different staff before he was brought on about a year ago. Wow. And that's not an anomaly. That's pretty normal for especially those critical roles education managers that are responsible for the success of students. Mm -hmm. General managers like Remy are responsible for managing the entire staff. The yeah. entire, that's and, and culture, you know, that kind of culture is going gonna, is gonna, to, we want to make sure we hire the right person there because they're going to bring the right culture to the team and the right mindset to the team. Yeah. And of course there have been mistakes along the way, yeah. right? But being completely honest with our staff about where things are at, yeah. not being afraid to say this isn't working mm -hmm. and, and coaching. And my co-founder Jeremy, uh, who I've yet to talk about, uh, has been a, 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 a amazing one of the, the biggest reasons why Legos has been successful is that he is, in my opinion, a great coach, especially of juniors that have joined our company, uh, but also of the leaders that have joined our company, in, giving, in setting the right culture. I'd like to take credit for it, but I think he takes a, a bigger chunk of that credit yeah. in terms of setting the culture in the company uh, amongst the staff and, and helping hire the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there something you guys look for specifically? Like, I'm not talking like hard skills, but more like traits or indicators that like, this person could be the right fit for a team is like, is there a certain attribute or something that you know you would find consistent in most of your staff? We talk about grit a lot in our company, and we talk about growth mindset a lot in our company. So those are the two things that we talk with students about before they even start the program, in the admissions yeah. process, in the prep course that they have to yeah. do before they start boot camp, for example. And the same is true for our staff. Yeah, uh, we want staff that are gritty. Yeah, uh, when it comes to and it, when I speak, to, when I'm talking about staff here, I mean the exact same in how we look and when we do our hour-long admissions process for our yeah. camps for students. Uh, we want to put them in a or, or learn from their stressful experiences how they handle them, mm -hmm. 
Um, are they always looking at themselves and what they could have improved when they're looking at situations yeah. that didn't go in, in the best possible yeah. way? Or do they point a finger and say, that was the problem, my manager was the problem, and so on, and this is how I dealt with it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with grit, it's really about uh, dedication to a particular thing, which is exactly what boot camp yeah. is. Yeah. Instead of, hey, I like to do a bunch of everything. Yeah. Right? That's also good, but for a certain period in your life, um, when you're trying to accomplish a certain mission, yeah. that grit is really important. Yeah. And so, is that what you look for in your admissions field as well? That's or? one of the biggest uh, things that are non-technical that we look at our look during okay. our student admissions yeah. process. Yeah, because that, that is one of the things I wanted to ask you is 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 I think one of the biggest biggest questions that you know frankly startups have for us is how do I know I'm hiring the right development talent? Um, and you said something earlier that kind of caught my attention, which is like you first that you have an admissions process. It's not just whoever hands you a bunch of money, you're gonna you're gonna accept them as a student. And I think that's a key part of how you maintain your ninety six percent. It's not just whatever. Um, but but also like what are what are the attributes of of a a team player that's a, with a development background is I guess what I'm trying to say because there are lots of founders that. Aren't technical. They are, they have hustle. They but you know when it comes to you know I'm sitting across from a potential candidate across the table. Frankly, it's like okay, you know C plus plus. I look at your resume. It says you do. I can't say otherwise. I guess here we go, right? So so what are some tips that you can kind of give those kind of people in terms of hiring? In technical? terms of hiring technical, both both culture and, and traits and, and things that you know you would recommend for for companies. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I've, that's a loaded question. No, 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 no. <laughs> I love that question. I mean, I've given, previously I've given talks yeah. uh, around hiring dev talent. I uh, have a lot of opinions in that matter. Yeah. Um, keep me under check if I go a little bit too <laughs> deep. Um, that's why we cut out with the fork, man. That's how it is. <laughs> um, and as, as somebody who's played the role of a quote unquote CTO or yeah. a dev developer lead yep. or manager in various different companies, my own and others, I've, I've interviewed in terms of developer talent to hire. I think I've interviewed, I haven't done an official count, but I think it's in the 300 plus yeah. developers to work with me in one of my companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, at, at Lighthouse, we have uh, approximately 100 active teachers right now mm -hmm. across Canada. Yeah. Uh, so that's Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, various others, so across six different cities. Yeah. Um, so many of the, the 300 that I'm mentioning mm -hmm. were actually developers hired as teachers, yeah. but still being assessed technically and looking at their yeah. mindset. Um, and then prior to that, mm -hmm. and even during this time, yeah. looking to hire them for dev roles as well. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the things we look for, everybody should be looking for. Yeah. Uh, and it's very easy to lose sight, sight of, of like exactly what do I need, especially when you don't have the technical skills yourself as the interviewer. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you go about, yeah. how do you go about interviewing technical talent that might be a future, especially at the startup stage, mm -hmm. that might be your CTO one day, mm -hmm. or that might be a senior developer in your team, yeah. right? Um, so for me, I come back to the two things that we really, really, that I personally think for myself that I've self-realized that, uh, that are really important in developers or just people in general. Yeah. A pursuit of lifelong learning is a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're kind of related. Pursuit of life, 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 lifelong learning and openness and not fear of change. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things in terms of personality that I want to check off right off the bat on someone. They're not technical, yeah. but they're really, really important in your technical staff. Yeah. Because the software world, this is yeah. why our education isn't four years long. This is why I have a beef <laughs> with my personal education, which was a computer science program. Because you gave them a Swift. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, there's the language piece, but there's yeah. the fact that the industry is constantly changing. And yes, you can point to software and technology as one, but it's not the only one. Mm -hmm. and. It, it may be one of the first few, but other industries are going to go through the same transformation of, whoa, stuff is changing really fast, either because of technology or because of other reasons, yeah. right? Because of societal reasons. And so what you really want to be looking for in people is how adaptive are they to change? And how, what are they doing to pursue lifelong learning? Like what have they really done in their life outside of their careers, outside of their jobs, in, 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 you know, in the kind of the holistic yeah, approach to their desire journey? To you know, oh, oh, that's that's super key. So I know I that didn't answer your question from a technical perspective, but I think it's that if I go directly into a technical answer, then it emphasizes that more than this, and yeah. I think this is more important. Yeah. Okay. And especially if they're going to be a leader in your space. Yeah. yeah. If they, especially if they're going to be setting the culture for other developers or helping you hire other developers. Yeah. 
right? So if they have that mindset yeah. and you trust them to be the technical person once you've done yeah. that due diligence, mm -hmm. then they're gonna also, you can, you can leave the technical yeah. due diligence to them, but hoping that you've hired the right personality from the lifelong learning mm -hmm. standpoint, you've now set that tone as well. And that's one of the, you know, you asked me about our staff and our culture. Again, same yeah. thing that we applied in our program and in our company, I mean. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I mean, I've talked, um, you're not the only person I've talked about this, like I've chatted with uh, Wilkins from The Thinking Ape. Nice. And they, they have a similar, it's not exactly the same, but his answer to me was, we just want to hire really, really smart people. And then it sounds sarcastic, like we don't want to hire any, right? But but I think what, what he means, really yeah, like what, what he really kind of means by that is, it's, is you know technical background of course they, they look at that but they don't hire going like we need we need a, a swift developer so like that's what we go and get if they're really yeah, smart this is a common yeah mistake. if they're really smart they're gonna learn and adapt swift and that's where you're coming with you know being being open to change right like if someone's sitting here going like I only coded for Android apps and I'm not I'm never gonna do an iOS app that's pretty unattractive I guess to them to you guys too. Um, one of our one of our biggest things that we say to students and our staff and ourselves is be comfortable being uncomfortable, and again that ties back to the constant change and lifelong yeah. learning. You know, you're somebody that actually loves the idea of being uncomfortable and constantly yeah. being on your toes mm -hmm. and not knowing necessarily the answer, but knowing that you can get the answer. Yeah. Because that is the definition of a good developer. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a good staff member, coincidentally. Yeah. And so both of those, a lot of our, what we what we preach to our students, for lack of a better word, is what we also look for in our staff. Yeah. That's awesome. Which is why you see a lot of our staff taking a look at, for example. Yeah, that's um, because they fit right into that culture. And, and just to touch on this slightly, because I, I know we could go on for hours about this, but just generally speaking, where are your thoughts on where, where post-secondary education fits in, where things like boot camps fit in, and how does that kind of, what does it, what does it look like in terms of just the landscape? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our program is um, is not a one size fits it solves all problems. I don't think any as a person who is a head of education and thinks about education and, and you know both from a philosophy and implementation yeah. standpoint, I don't believe that one size our program is great for all situations. Yeah. Just the same is true for university and, and colleges. Um, there's definitely a right um, approach and a right audience yeah. um, based on their life situation yeah. to go through a computer science or similar like an engineering program if they were to potentially become a developer yeah right and for us uh, it you know a lot of the students that come to us are some sometimes they are high school students yeah. uh, but that's an I would say an outlier uh, yeah. a majority of our students are people that are actually lifelong learners who have already gone through a undergraduate yeah. or potentially beyond like a master's or yeah. PhD program yeah. you know we've had PhD of physics take our program wow. we've had neuroscientists take our program yeah but we've also had, as I mentioned, like very young kind of in-university or pre-university students take our program. Yeah. The majority, though, are career changers. Cool. So that's where we really fit into the yeah. mold is, okay, I've already done a lot of education yeah. and I have a great background in finance yeah. or health, you know, or yeah. psychology yeah. or winemaking. Like we've had, you can name any single profession, we've had them take our program. That's really awesome. Yeah. And what's really cool is that, and I envy our students because I came from a traditional computer science background, yeah. right? My family was very traditional and pushing me towards like, okay, you're gonna like graduate high school, you're gonna go to university, you're gonna get a job right after, and that's exactly yeah. the kind of path I followed. And I'm envious of our students because they took a very, they're coming from a, let's say a poli-sci background yeah. with a breadth of knowledge that I don't have about how our society yeah. works and how politics work, for example. Yeah. And then they're bringing in the software knowledge that yeah. I took four or five years to get and they're getting most of that in yeah. a short time span, at least yeah. the relevance of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they're able to merge the two and potentially go work for a company that maybe reforming yeah. our politics, our, yeah. our political landscape, using software and technology. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. using technology like blockchain or whatever it may be. That's yeah. why people right. say tech industry is kind of a funny thing to <laughs> imagine because tech is Because we all type the exams on computers. So. It's like tech is in every <laughs> industry and, and it's about to get more and more yeah. infiltrated into yeah. absolutely every industry. It's a really good way to put yeah. it. Yeah. So you're now able to yeah, merge both, like if yeah. you've got a degree in neuroscience and you've got a degree in, in health and care or whatever and yeah tech is going into those industries more than ever yeah so, so to make it really personal let's say you have a son or daughter that doesn't matter they're they're graduating high school um would and they might be interested in, in coding what what would you advise them to do and, and i understand that it depends on their personalities and 
Yeah, I mean, there's no one right answer again, <laughs> yeah, for but sure. uh, we'll have to make some assumptions to get yeah, yeah. that question. Um, make them do a double major. <laughs> I, I, I really, yeah I do I do struggle with you know at a macro level yeah. how our society is structured in terms of the education journey yeah. right the, the growth is very much like I said we're front loaded with yeah. these university programs yeah. uh, and the problem with that is is it actually doesn't we talked about lifelong learning and change yeah I think all, all of us on the table agree that yeah. the education system right, I saw NAS doesn't really accommodate that yeah. yeah. Right? And that's the one problem that, that's the problem that Lighthouse Labs is trying to solve, at least in the developer landscape. Right? We can't solve this for everybody. We're, we're still a, a reasonably small company, yeah. <laughs> but we're starting to look at that with developers, yeah. and then maybe one day we'll look at that for other... Um, yeah. But my hope is that other people will look at this <laughs> as well. Yeah. So yeah, we have colleges and universities saying, like, yeah, take this program, pay this much money, and get, get student debt in an industry, if we're picking computer science, as your yeah. question yeah. is. This is constantly changing. By the time I started and finished university, so much had changed in computer science and yeah. the technology industry. My degree is useless. <laughs> useless. I have a major what was your background? marketing from McGill, mm -hmm. and so good party school, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. no. It, it's so funny. So it's 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 shy and I are so different when it comes to to our school. So I went as an issue She went to McGill. She said yeah, marketing. This is funny. We should do this, this um, comparison. So so I am I was terrible and am. I recently took a course and was terrible in that. Um, a terrible student because I, I need goals to accomplish it. And, and I had to be great going into university, but because my, I knew my goal was getting into university. Once I got to university, I was like, what is my goal? What is the lowest amount of work I can do to get this degree? I literally did the MVP of school. <laughs> that was my mentality in year one once I realized like I could. An entrepreneur, you were an entrepreneur from the get go. Eh? Not not so much entrepreneur, but I just I wasn't really interested. Startup entrepreneur. Yeah, I wasn't interested in 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 you know vanity stats, which is you know I have I have honor rolls. I didn't know, and this is probably a mistake looking back, is that like you know you could do well enough in school so you don't need that part time job or, or whatever like scholarships and things. Like that. that would have been a nice goal to have. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I made the same mistake when it comes to like yeah, not, yeah. Not, not not really hacking the, the financial exactly. side of it. Exactly. So I'm not that's really, really I'm not really suggesting that mm -hmm. no you shouldn't study or, or so on and so forth. But but that's just that was you know me in university. Mm -hmm. uh, shot it yeah. across from me. <laughs> Is the other experience? We we talked about this and we compared <laughs> our experiences and I was the complete opposite where I was like the student who did absolutely everything, did all the readings, all the projects, even the stuff that wasn't graded. You ever thought of being a dev? <laughs> no. I didn't even buy the book. So like I did, I did every reading, I did every project, and when it wasn't graded, I thought this is probably gonna, it's meant to be here for a reason to help me get better or something that will be graded. So I do it anyways, and I had no ability to prioritize. Like everything was like the most important, and so I like worked so hard and tried so hard and my put a lot of importance in my GPA and when people warned me, some people said your GPA doesn't matter when you go out and you try to get a job, no one's gonna look at your GPA and I'm like, that's a lie. That's trick you're tricking me. That's not true. Some people and do, I, some people do. and I didn't believe them and anyways I worked my butt off like I was ultra keener. And I graduated with a BCom major in marketing and minor in HR with a 3.7 GPA. That's amazing. And I was like, and now she <laughs> hangs out with Sarah on this podcast. And no I was wonder so, you like marathons. I was so proud of it. And then when I went out into the real world, I a realized that my degree was useless. B realized that nobody gave a shit about my GPA. And like the only thing that mattered was McGill. On my CV. So you get a like, general studies degree. So I could have, I could have just Ultimately, chilled yeah. and and just floated above academic. So I, I, dis I, I disagree with that. I'll just say that. Like I think what you showed though was yeah. that word that I just said earlier, which is great. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Sam has no good. I think I think I think university, like the software engineers that I respect, equally if not more, yeah. are the ones that didn't necessarily have a computer science formal yeah. education. But they did still do what you, mm -hmm. probably they still did what you were talking about, which is still work their ass off, if I, if I can use that word, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. during university. Yeah. To just show themselves and set the like habit mm -hmm. of like, I'm going to push through this, whether I like it or not. Yeah. And, I mean, so yeah. a lot of it was that for sure. Like when I was going through school, I had really supportive parents that said, you don't have to graduate. Like, we don't care. Like, we just want you to do you. Yeah. And I had thoughts of it. I was like, is school right for me? Yeah. Um, and I almost 
the only the reason I really pushed me through, I was like, I'm gonna finish what I started. Like that was my mentality. Yeah. Even if I didn't wasn't sure if marketing was what I wanted to do, and even now that I'm entering the workforce and I've been working in a few different yeah. areas, I realized more and more that marketing is less and less what I want to do, which is crazy. That's what I invested four years of my life in. But looking back at how it was structured and what I learned, I think that there's a lot wrong with how our education system is, yep. and it's really not practical. It's like yep. you, it's not something that you can implement right away. It's not up to date. Like with marketing, how in the world did I graduate with a major in marketing, knowing f all about digital marketing? How? Yeah, you yeah. know, there's definitely uh, things I could put to the computer science world. The same thing, like you don't, so, yeah. you, know, you don't actually touch code as much as you should be yeah. in university. Yeah, I think it comes down to expectations, though. Yeah. I think what a lot of us, when we applied in high school, yeah. you know, we checked off the six uh, ranked universities for us. What's yeah. our number one choice and what's our number six choice or whatever? Is we were told by our guidance counselors and others, or we were implied to, that this is a vocational thing. Yeah. But universities, not most programs aren't vocational. They're not actually about getting a what job. job. Now, there's a little bit of like, I think we're kind of in a transitioning period mm -hmm. in society where universities are having a little bit of an identity crisis, yeah. trying to figure out what part of it is your vocational, what part of it is academic and about your personal growth, yeah. your network, your confidence in self, growing up as a person, you know, studying something in the grit side, yeah. whether directly or indirectly. A lot of that skill that you learned in university, and the same for me, was necessary. And, and I think there's also that expectation. If you had gone in with that expectation, maybe you would have not been as disenfranchised yeah. about your university experience. Yeah. So that's one thing that we've been very conscious about in terms of setting expectations with mm -hmm. our students sure. that yeah. come in, right? And I mean, for me, when I was in college, I was definitely very like, yeah, college is useless, university is useless, you know, actually getting the practical. And it's, it's really funny because like, you know, now I'm a little bit more aged. <laughs> Um, and, and I've actually flip-flopped in this, and I mean, I mentor high school students, and for the majority of them, I am telling them to go to some post-secondary thing. And, and here's the key thing, yeah, um, I, 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 think, I think the main thing is, 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 is right, you're setting expectations. Yeah. I think you're, if you go in and you're expecting to get job B come out of it, you'd be better off with, with a boot camp of X. Pick the topic, and yeah. maybe it was marketing for you, yeah. pick the topic at the time yeah. that you are really interested in learning, yeah. unfortunately for the next four or five years, <laughs> due to the structure of this, yeah. and that's okay, it's yeah. not terrible. Yeah. Um, don't worry about what job you get out of the end. Yeah. That's at least my philosophy. Yeah. It could be a philosophy to Because if you yeah. learn anything, is that, it, that like you can have this whatever degree and end up doing something completely different. Yeah. And that's the amazing Unless part. you're like a doctor or a lawyer or like whatever, an engineer, where you need those actual you know, skills to yeah. do that job, but even then you can use that and go in a whole different career. Yeah. But, but it's a yeah. but it's a safety net is what I'm trying to get at. It's, it is it's, a it's, it's yeah. expensive. There's a practical side to it. It's expensive, well. but but if you can afford it, it is, you're free to try. I think I think the joke of it all is I can walk around saying like I'm a student and people will be there's no judgment or whatever. Yeah. If I'm not a student, same age, same person, I go in and be like I'm unemployed. I'm just hanging out. It's different, right? So, so you kind of get a pass by seeing like, okay, I'm a student. I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And you know, for the for the, I'd say it's less than one percent. That's just Steve Jobs of the world, who who knew exactly what he was at probably like age eighteen or whatever the heck he, he was coming out of high school. Like those people knew what they were doing. And that's why we get these famous startup stories of people dropping out or whatever. For everybody else, they think they know what they want, but they haven't experienced anything, right? Like, how do you know you want to? You, you you want to do business development for a startup when you've never sold a single thing in your life, yeah. right? Like whether it's part of your school program or you've got a part-time job, like whatever it is, yeah. like you, you haven't experienced enough things. And, and yeah. university, again, being practical, like if, if it's affordable, is a safety net for you to actually go and experience those things. So I didn't learn like practical, I didn't learn about how to blog or how to write in university. But I learned things like, I learned how to be an adult, I learned how to prioritize. Yep. Like when I have three papers due at the same time and because I was an idiot and didn't do it before and planned well, now I have a decision. Which one of these three papers am I gonna do, right? <laughs> um, am I gonna do half of each and then maybe pass one? Um, or am I just gonna go full throttle, I give up on these other two? Like those are decisions that students, you know, in my case, bad students, yeah. have to learn how to make. And, and I think the number one thing I, need at my job now, like we can try to talk about it weekly, is prioritization. Right? Like we, we have 18 fires, which one are you gonna save first? Mm -hmm. 
and which one are you best at saving first and which ones you know we have to delegate and things like that. Like that to me was a skill I had to learn because I had to screw up eighteen thousand times in school. Yeah. Which you know if I screwed up here, those, those oh, if I screwed up here, I'd be fired eighteen times. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, I, I definitely agree with that. You learn how to, yeah. The, you learn how to learn, pretty much. Like, that's, that's a big part of, of what we yeah. focus on as well, mm -hmm. right? It's, and that's the part that we share at these uh, universities, is not only you're not here, I think a lot of uh, misconception with boot camps yeah. is, and it makes me cringe uh, even today, uh, especially when we started, as we were referred to as a Rails boot camp, or a Ruby boot camp, which was very much focused on the technology, the language, yeah. the framework mm -hmm. that you learn. And I would always say to people, no, 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 we're a, like, we're a web development boot camp. We're yeah. still like very specific. You're coming here to learn web development. We're now doing iOS. We started with yeah. iOS in 2014, so we're web and iOS development bootcamp. Yeah. You know that particular program is not about learning specific tools or languages. You're learning how to learn those because in our industry, that stuff changes constantly. Yeah. yeah. Our students that we graduated, you know, either last year or recently, don't necessarily go out and aren't currently working necessarily with the exact same languages, whether it be JavaScript or yeah. Ruby or yeah. HTML, CSS. Or Swift or Objective C. Yeah, they're not necessarily using those languages on the job. One of the weeks at the tail end of the program is very much dedicated to actually throwing them in the deep end. Yeah, when they feel they're a little bit more ready for it, yeah. and giving them not only a different language, a different framework, yeah. but also like existing code base, which is more of the real world, to yeah. simulate as much as as much as possible yeah. of that like jumping into like a freezing cold water, yeah. which is your first job, mm -hmm. yeah. and feeling overwhelmed. And trying to achieve results at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're learning and trying to achieve results, you know, with an existing code base that you've never seen before. It's like this product that a company, fictitious company, already owns. Um, and so you have to kind of really adapt. And yeah. that's really what bootcamp prepares you for. Yeah. That's really what a good developer. When you talk about it. again, circling yeah. back to yeah. what to look for in a developer, that's why we do those things. Is because yeah. we, look, we value that versus. You know, yes, that we uses Rails as a technology and we teach with Rails. Yeah. But it's not the goal that we isn't to learn Rails. It's to learn those things with Rails. That's just a vehicle. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, but you know, uh, coming back to the university uh, and, uh, and what would I tell my kids? I mean, I, I was lucky in that at the age of like eight, I think, or ten, I had my my parents bought me a computer, and this wasn't even in Canada. This was in Pakistan. I was dealing with pre-Pentium computers, just playing video games. Um, yeah, my, nice. my parents encouraged me to get into community at yeah, Dos. My parents encouraged me to uh, do some uh, community work, and I ended up teaching adults how to do word processing and a little bit of programming on the computer. Good. That's awesome. Right? That's and, uh, and same thing in high school, same thing in university. Always became a TA. So I think I discovered my passion, the two passions that I have today that have kind of brought together at Lighthouse. Those are programming and solving problems with code and teaching. Mm -hmm. Education basically. Yeah. So um, awesome. I'm very lucky in that I didn't have the oh, what am I doing for university? I knew exactly from like high school, if not yeah. earlier, that I was going to get into software and, and uh, yeah. software programming. And I um, and I, I knew in the back of my mind that I, I thought that I would get into education at a much later point in my life. You know, again, that traditional mindset of yeah. I'll work a lot in the industry. And then I'll retire as a part-time professor somewhere. Those who yeah. no longer do teach. <laughs> <laughs> right? But yeah. I was really lucky in being exposed. I didn't come up with the boot camp model and actually being exposed to another boot camp working with them in Toronto. Yeah. The first one in Canada, actually. And a lot of lessons that I learned and brought to Lighthouse were lessons of successes and failures that they had, like the goods yeah. and the bads yeah. of what they did. I brought and executed, in my opinion, better in Vancouver and beyond, right? And from there, next year, we started, we expanded back to Toronto. And, yeah, and it's actually, one of the stories that came from Toronto, went back. Yeah, um, and Montreal now as well, that's one of our major cities. So, so, really so happy with that. For, for you guys, like, are there any fun, not, I guess not fundamental differences, but like you offer the similar programs in here, Toronto, I guess now Montreal. Um, what are the differences like that you've seen, you know, you, you see both sides and, and now you're, you're talking into Montreal as well, but like, what are the differences in, in, in how people work, culture, or are there any differences? And even in like the, the market, like with yeah. the demand for, for junior developers between all those cities, how do you see it growing and changing? And what are the differences? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been through so many different cities in, in Canada, and not just the major ones that you just listed, but you know, our first satellite campus was actually in the Yukon. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it was really cool visiting the Yukon and, yeah. and launching a pilot of our satellite, which is like essentially a remote cohort yeah. being live streamed to, as well as having local mentors available. It's something that we started with um, in 2015. Yeah. 
uh, in the uh, in the Yukon. Yeah. Um, but then brought to Calgary, brought to Victoria, Halifax, you know, Montreal, which is now becoming yeah. a more, you know, uh, bigger campus. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the difference in the markets, yeah, it's, it's very different actually. Not just because of the size. You know, Vancouver, for example, has much still has that village feel, more of the big city feel, mm -hmm. uh, where it's it's actually easier than you know than the New Yorks or the Torontos mm -hmm. of the world to be able to make the connections with people. Uh, to have to get references from one person to yeah. the other, where everybody's kind of got your back and everybody's kind of working together. Mm -hmm. Toronto's a lot more of the hustle. Mm -hmm. The uh, there's a lot more of the financial background, so a lot of students end up working at um, not a lot, but more so than Vancouver. Students will end up graduating yeah. and working as developers in financial companies, yeah, fintech. Uh, fintech, mm -hmm. for example, right? Um, Vancouver has a lot more of the holistic lifestyle companies, mm -hmm. not lifestyle companies in terms of how they're run, yeah. but that their pursuit. Is often about wellness, for example. Yeah. Mm, services. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's really cool to see that uh, diversity across Canada. Yeah. Uh, I don't think every country can speak to it in the way that we can. I think yeah. I'm pretty lucky that we are focused on Canada and that yeah. we, we have essentially lived our adult lives here. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, you know, if you look at a city like Calgary, for example. Yeah. A city that's been um, branded, I guess, as very much focused on in natural resources and oil. Yeah. But we've had a great success there in terms of other types of startups as well. Yeah, um, definitely. I've talked to a few people about Calgary and Alberta in general, kind of growing into the tech scene now, because Alberta has the best provincial funding of Canada in terms of grants mm -hmm. and tax credits, and that support innovation in all shapes and forms, like as like actual physical hardware and and tech. So it's cool because they've got lots of support and people are now starting to figure that out and they want that to evolve and they want it to merge with their oil and gas industries to yeah. find out more efficient and green ways to operate. Just yeah, like universities, booming. right? Cities have their focus, but they also provide a lot of other things from a yeah. holistic perspective. Montreal, if we were to talk about another example, is very much doing really well on the uh, AI front, yeah, right? So, yeah. so with Facebook, with Element AI and companies of that nature. Um, are, are really fueling that growth, but at the same time, there's going to be fintech companies and healthcare companies and, and yeah. those types of startups um, yeah. in, in all aspects of Canada, right? And I think what's also happening is a lot of North American, so uh, you know, companies from the US mm -hmm. uh, raising money in the financial capitals, right? So the, the West Coast or the East Coast, so San Francisco or New York, and then actually executing their startups in Canada. Yeah. It's really cool to see. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's bringing the reverse, it's kind of reversing the brain drain in a way mm -hmm. that we've had with our senior developers. A big problem in Canada is our senior developers leaving to work for companies in, yeah. in other geographical locations where it's more lucrative, like the US. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of a backwards action on that now, especially so, with the startup visa program. We're, yeah. we're getting some interest from US companies wanting to move to Canada or yeah. wanting to just start in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. So, but for us, you know, one of the others, if you don't mind me yeah. rambling further. Um, <laughs> What we want to really see in Canada is not just, you know, talking about markets, not just uh, more and more junior developers entering the market. Yeah. Of course, it's good to have junior developers into the market because without them, you're not going to have the intermediate <laughs> seniors. Yes. You know, we, many of our grads from two, three, four years ago are now in the inter could be labeled as yeah. intermediates, potentially seniors, depending yeah, on how you label that. that funnel. Yeah. But even just that idea of like labeling intermediates and seniors is something we're now like tackling. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Like what constitutes an intermediate developer? What constitutes a senior developer? Like people don't really have a good language or a good definition yeah. for how to define that. And I think Lighthouse Labs is in a great place given that we've been yeah. working with industry with so many community partners, with so many employers that work with our career services department for them to get quarterback into jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've worked with so many of those employers, we constantly speak with them. Let's figure out a what what else can Lighthouse do in terms of that whole journey. You yeah. know, if it's just a boot camp, then again it has the same problem yeah. of okay, we're just there for the beginning, so you're and then it's up to the employers how to help really, people get from junior to to the, intermediate and to senior. senior. But before we even while we do that, while we try to solve that, we should also just look at it from a like take a step back and understand what constitutes a good intermediate or what constitutes a good senior. And so those are a lot of the conversations yeah. we're having internally exactly. and with our partners, That's great. Yeah. right? Because the programs that we've just recently launched, we didn't get a chance to talk about those. By the way, you asked me a question about how many people we graduated, I never answered. I said 75 cohorts. 30 students per? Uh, no, not that high. You know, that, would be, that would be one of the lessons I learned not to do. Um, but I think we are above a thousand um, junior, like wow. people that have graduated programs yeah. are now working as junior developers across Canada. Yeah. 
Um, so in five years, that's quite an accomplishment. I guess that yeah. averages out to what, 200? Yeah. Like you said, that's a lot of data right there. Like that's a lot of like 10,000 people you hopefully can reach back out to to get their feel and get get a better understanding on Well, what's cool is like the people that graduated your first cohort, if they're still in the field, are now five years experienced developers. It's, kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting because yeah. at that point, somebody would have entered a computer science, five year computer science degree. Yeah. And to compare somebody that took our program five years ago and worked in industry, in the industry yeah. compared to somebody who has now graduated from, let's say, mm -hmm. University of Guelph, where I went, or Waterloo, or whatever, yeah. after five years, mm -hmm. I don't know, but I think it's pretty clear to me yeah. what was a, a good path, yeah. Yeah. especially, again, for those career changers that yeah. it doesn't make sense to go back to an undergraduate program after doing, yeah. let's say, 10 years or five years in some yeah. other field, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? For sure. But anyway, what I was, sorry for the digression, <laughs> but... Um, you know, one of the things we're launched, we've launched recently yeah. and are going to continue working on and iterating on is uh, a program, programs that help further grow developers. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of where we're going. Yeah. Um, so offering programs for developers, mm -hmm. whether it be through workshops yeah. um, or yeah. lunch and learns, but more importantly... It's more accessible to people who are already working. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly. It's part-time programs, mm -hmm. still with the in-person in model, which is something we believe firmly in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a lot of good use cases for online education. Yeah. I think it fits in and we leverage it. Yeah. But at the same time, that in-person kind of camaraderie that comes with everybody being in the same room, yeah. even if it's part-time, is huge. Yeah. And so the blockchain program that we recently announced and launched yeah. for devs, it's not a blockchain program for anybody looking to understand about the industry. There's a program that I think Launch Academy has yeah. that's like very much focused on the entrepreneurial side yeah. and the how do you understand this whole industry yeah. as a, without coming from a developer background? Yeah. Yeah. And then with us, it's like, okay, you're an existing developer, junior, intermediate, whatever. That's you. We've had our teachers yeah. take this program. And how do you then start working with things like Solidity or yeah. you know things like, cool. just yeah. or, or even like vetting other languages yeah. um, or frameworks within the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. That knowledge. You know, we get into the frameworks and the, and the languages like yeah. Ethereum and Hyperledger. But we don't just, just like with our bootcamp, we don't get caught up in just those yeah. without really stepping back and understanding what are the things that we want a good blockchain yeah. developer to have. And so we look at things like ethics, we look at things like how do you, how do you learn something that's so emerging that there is very little coursework for. It's yeah. very, that's not structured. You can't, there's no like, there's no easy yeah. program that you yeah. can just take. Yeah. And even ours, is, it's, it's more about the dialogue and the communication and the yeah. project-based learning, the hands-on learning by doing Right, which is, we didn't really say explicitly, but it's the big thing that's missing from university. Yeah. In my experience, mm -hmm. is the you know is the departure. Like you said, how did I yeah. graduate marketing without learning about digital marketing? It's that I didn't learn enough by doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It'd be, it, that, that's something that I feel is really missing from college and university. That's a very yeah, prevalent in coding. I think internships should be not suggested to students in their vacation or their summer breaks, but it should be like incorporated into your education. That's what your university will And I was very lucky that University of Guelph, same thing. If I had that opportunity, yeah. being like, you can take a semester and take this internship, it's going to be worth this many credits, you will be graded on it, you will work just like a course, but you'll be doing a job and be hands-on. That, I would have 100% taken that opportunity, but it, it wasn't given to me, so therefore, it was either I did that in my summers, or I didn't do it at all, and I was paying my like, university fees, so I had to work through the summer. So I felt like when I graduated, I felt like a little bit bitter about that because I had a few friends who were a little bit more well off, and they were yeah. they, they could afford to take an unpaid internship or like a very a shitty it. paid yeah. internship and and get that hands-on experience um, on their in their summer breaks, and while I had to work like at a bar or a restaurant or whatever for the whole so we to afford a school, yeah. then I graduated with zero experience and it was really hard for me to find a job. I had racked up quite a bit of OSAP, the Ontario Student uh, you know, Assistance Program, I think it stands for, basically government loan, yeah. as well as like bank loan, yeah. student loan, and it took me like five, six years to pay it off. Mm -hmm. While having co-op programs, by the way, so I was lucky that I took off like, and that's what inspired, by the way, mm -hmm. a lot of the learn by doing is my time at university, believe yeah. it or not, where yeah. I was lucky enough that there was a co-op program and I got very good co-op internships yeah. that I realized, yeah. holy shit, I'm, holy crap, I'm learning a lot yeah. on the job. Yeah. And really that's what that's what it's all about. Yeah. Especially in a craft-based occupation like ours. Yeah. Right? Like software development is not a science. Computer science in itself is kind of misleading. There's definitely yeah. the theoretical academic side of it. But then when it comes to vocation, mm -hmm. that disconnect. Yeah. 
It's very much a craft. Yeah. When it comes to building apps, and whether they're you mobile or web or blockchain or being a DevOps person yeah. or whatever it may be, it's very much a craft. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a gray area there. Mm -hmm. It's very much about like learning through experience. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely. But I mean, on the on the topic growth, and and we hinted at this last week. Um, we promised this would be a very big episode, so here we are. That's big news. Big news. Um, what what's the announcement we have for you guys in terms of growth? Well, quite a few things happening. We talked okay. about a little bit uh, off air before we started, yeah. I guess. Um, so we are in the process of moving. It's bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, both in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, so we're moving into um, in Vancouver, which we're actually bringing what's already in Toronto, our other entity, Dev Hub, <laughs> which is all about developer. It's a developer hub, oh, right? Yeah. It's a space similar to Launch Academy, but instead of four entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. it's four devs by devs. Four devs by devs, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much not just a space, just like Launch Academy, it's a community, right? It's a community for devs. And so we're going to have different companies working out of there that are very much debt focused mm -hmm. um, and we're looking for tenants there um, which is you know something that's going to be an ongoing thing yeah. just like Launch Academy constant yeah. constant change in the startup world yeah. um, but you know um, something that's going to be pretty exciting for us Where's your um, new location? So that's right. Our new location is I believe still in Gastown but on the edge of Gastown at uh, West Georgia, 401 West Georgia is the address so it's in a it's in a, it's got full floor 13,000 square feet um, Georgia and, uh, and Homer. That's exciting. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the when's office tour? morning. When's the tour? We actually have a tour this week uh, for, our, for alumni and our students. Uh, yeah. And beyond that, I actually don't know. You have to ask Remy. But it is, it's something we're going to move into pretty soon. And uh, it's going to be bittersweet because we're not going to be officially in Launch Academy, although it'll always be a yeah. part of us. Um, so that's and one I big I'm not going to get to eat Becky's cakes anymore. <laughs> yes, that, that's the real, real spoiler here, right? Yeah. And no. you were saying? Uh, another is that we are, we, as I mentioned, uh, we've launched um, this track of programs for developers that are part-time. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that's being piloted right now and is going to come to Vancouver very soon, in September, yeah. is the blockchain program for developers. So if you're a developer who is, uh, like, hasn't really tapped into the blockchain or has played around with some online courses, but doesn't, it's really hard to kind of learn and yeah. kind of learn especially by doing on that, um, we have a program that's perfect for you. That's part-time. It's part-time 12-week part program. But the last four weeks are a final project, okay. uh, but uh, the eight first eight weeks are very, very structured cool. um, and uh, it allows people to work with their schedules. And so companies are sending their, their developers to us and yeah. so, you know, and many yeah. other types of people are coming. So, I mean, between DevHub, the blockchain programs and the other programs, and, you know, maybe even your iOS course, how can people find out about this? So, quite a few different things. Obviously, you can go to uh, our website, so lighthouselabs.ca. Yeah. Uh, or devhub.ca, the yeah. two different uh, entities that we talked about. Um, you can reach out to us, so whatever medium you prefer, right? Whether it be Twitter or Facebook, yeah. you can pretty easily find us on those mediums, so I won't talk about handles. But at the same time, if you prefer to just reach out to us and talk to us, honestly, one of the best ways to come learn more about this is to talk to us. So mm -hmm. in person, right? Whether it's in Vancouver or yeah, Toronto just come, or various just solutions. walk in. Walk in, yeah. honestly walk in. That happens all the time. People look just like walk in. Yeah. We're located in Launch Academy. If you don't know where that is, you should look it up because it's yeah. awesome. Um, <laughs> and then when you look confused, you go, Karam? Looking for Karam? I heard him on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. um, and in Toronto and then soon in Vancouver, we're going to be located in DevHub. So you'll find us, awesome. find our address online, come talk to us, give us a call. Our, website, our, our phone number is on the website. Right. Worst case, or if you're just preferring email, hello at lighthouselabs.ca. Simple. Yeah. Simple. Love it. So, I mean, with with that, I mean, that, like Karam said, is bittersweet. Um, but it is good news for entrepreneurs out there because that means that Launch Camp, if you get the math right, is we are accepting a bunch, I wouldn't say a ton, we have a bunch of spots. We have to open. fill up all the empty desks of all the Lighthouse Lab staff. So. Some, of the, some of them have already been taken for it. But if you're an entrepreneur, if you're listening to this podcast um, and you're looking for the community that, that Karam was talking about, and glowingly but not paid spoke of earlier in this episode um, come come to our website we're gonna have a brand new spanking website in the next couple of days um, we are taking new applicants in for for August and we want you to be the next Lighthouse Labs um, and then if, yeah. if you have questions about that specifically you can email me this time I'm not gonna give Shadi's email it's sam at launchacademy.ca dot ca not dot com um, and let's let's just have a conversation. Like we'll talk. We we we've been around long enough. Let's be real. That we've seen companies come and go, and, and we're always super excited when when people are graduating on from Launch Academy, like like Lighthouse is, right? Because there's there's a different way to graduate, and that's a very realistic part of startups too. 
98% of startups fail, right? But when somebody's outgrown us, mm -hmm. I think that is a cause for celebration. Of course. Right? So, so with that said, um, before, because I am starving, dude. We're going to do food. Um, we talk for let's, too long. Let's, uh, do you have any last minute announcements for us? Well, I do want to announce we have a really cool um, event coming up next week that everybody should sign up for. I did talk a little bit about it last episode. It's our uh, Gone to Sea funding. And the panel is going to be all Launch Academy alumni. So we've got Monique from Lendified, we've got Sarah from Vital Signs, and Craig from Run and Go. So it's going to be a really cool panel of people talking about their experience through seed fundraising. And, and there's going to be a lot to learn. So for all LA members, you get to go for free. So just sign up. And then everybody else out there, I think it's like 10 bucks. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for putting up with my rambling. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. And just some housekeeping items if you aren't following, and why aren't you following us if you've been yeah. listening for like this hour and 15 minutes, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Launch Academy HQ, um, so you can get all the tidbits, and sometimes we do sneak peeks of what we're eating too, but more specifically, what are we eating today? Better not So I chose pizza. food today, producer <laughs> ladies got it all covered up. Do you have any shout outs? Like, oh, shout out to Shadi's mom, I have another yeah. one. She is she's our most avid listener, so there you go. Oh, we so, get it's not an insult. I know you stop looking at me with some crazy eyes. Well, no, no, I've been Are you guys ready? I'm really excited about this. Whoa, whoa. It's a Oh wow, psych. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big psych. There's nothing. It's a box. But it's chopsticks, so I'm thinking it's not a she gave me two pieces. This is pizza. nothing new to you guys. I just thought it'd be delicious. It's about. Nice. Big fan of it. So I don't miss on the green. So, so like, you get to choose one. I think this one is called Bao Chi Bao Bao. <laughs> and then I think the middle one is tuna, and then this one is pork. So, so you just have we, have we have just had that down? I have had that down. Is it, is it, yeah, is it a preferred spot? Or I know we talk off air about, about different types of food and stuff like that. And you were you're pretty. I'm very opinionated about food. I didn't, I didn't bring anything too crazy this week because I was like, you know what, let's just have a good She food. played it safe. I actually, so. got, I actually got yelled at quite a bit on Reddit when I uh, put some pretty strong opinions about Vancouver's food scene. <laughs> wow. I got some down votes and up votes. Well, was it like our Vancouver though? Like, our Oh, uh, it was our Vancouver, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then you're, yeah. you're going to say yeah. something critical about Vancouver. I think Vancouver has some awesome food when it comes to, obviously, um, you know, things like this, Vietnamese yeah. food, um, Chinese food, Japanese yeah. food, oh my god, it's amazing, right? The, the Especially the health food yeah, as well yeah. when it comes to fusion. See, that's the problem with it. Pick with whatever looks best to you. Food. Wait, which one did you pick? Uh, the, mm. the, the one that looks like it has a inside. Oh, yeah. It's all good. Alright, so I guess it's a good time to say bye to the camera. Thank bye you. Bye, camera. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. Um, yeah, so, so make sure you guys check out Lighthouse Labs. Did we stop? No, it's I'm still on air. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys next week. Lighthouse Labs.ca, launchacademy.ca. We'll see you soon. See ya.